In the Bible, God had kings who ruled over his people. God had priests who represented his people at the altar. And then God had prophets who spoke to the kings and the priests and the people for God. Prophets are usually the men who cried out against the wickedness of their day. They were the preachers. And usually the prophets or the writings of the prophets make the most interesting and many times the most effective kind of preaching. So for the next few weeks, Lord willing, we will be preaching through the book of Isaiah. We'll try to put it in its context. We realize at the time of Isaiah that Israel is divided between the north and the south. They've been divided from the time of Solomon under Rehoboam and Jeroboam. The northern tribes consisted of ten, and their headquarters was in Samaria. The two tribes were in the south, and Judah, I'm sorry, Jerusalem, was the headquarters. Some of the prophets were sent to the Jews in the south. Others were sent to the northern tribes, Elijah and Elisha, for instance. Though they were not writing prophets, they were prophets nonetheless. Isaiah, a writing prophet, was sent to the, the southern tribes of Judah, and he prophesied and cried against the wickedness of Israel and Judah. Now listen, God has many attributes. When we think of God, we may think of many things. One thing that we know about God is that God is a consuming fire. Not only is God love, but God is a consuming fire. The Bible says that God dwells in the light in which no man can approach. It would be easier for you to walk into a fiery furnace than it would be to approach God um, unless he allowed you to do that. Now all of this, when we think about God being a consuming fire, and so on, and a just and a righteous God may seem hard at first. But there's another side of God that we need to see, which is in this text, and that God is a reasonable and a rational God. The difference between men and animals is that animals are not rational or reasonable creatures. Animals operate on instinct. They are made after their kind. But God made man in his own image, and man has rationale. Did you know the beaver builds his dam the way he did from the very beginning? The sparrow builds her nest the same. The birds migrate the same. But man has gone from the cave to the skyscraper. He's gone from the horse to the rocket ship. In other words, man can reason and he can improve and he can build. But animals do the same thing over and over and over. You can teach a chimpanzee to ride a tricycle. But no chimpanzee has ever, nor will it ever, teach another chimpanzee to ride a tricycle. It just can't, it won't work. Because they are brute beast, regardless of how the evolutionist tries to connect us to them. Now, I agree that some of them may have descended from monkeys. But those of us who are saved believe that God is our creator. I heard that down at the University of Washington there was a science professor, and he had written a little poem, and it went something like this for his class. Once I was a tadpole, long and thin, and then I was a frog with my tail tucked in. Then I was a monkey in a tropical tree. And now I'm a doctor with a Ph.D. Now that's just about the, the progressiveness of evolution. But those of us who know the God of the Bible and the Bible of God know that man is a direct creation of God. And that he is created in the image of God and that he can reason about certain things. That being so, God calls us to reason. He said, I'm a reasonable God. You're a reasonable creature. Let's get together and reason about this situation. You want to reason it out? Let's reason. Let's think about it. There's logic. There's a sequence. There are laws of logic. They take classes in logic. And uh, so he says, let's get together and let's reason about this situation. First of all, he said, let's reason about the fact of sin. He, you know that there are some people who try to deny sin. They don't even believe it exists. They try to say that it's ignorance. If we could just educate people, we wouldn't have sin. <laughs> you know better than that, don't you? You think they have no sin at the University of Washington? You think they have no sin at the White House? You think they have no sin at the Kremlin? 
Why? This idea that educated people don't sin is a lot of nonsense. You see, if we could just educate people, we'd take care of it. Some folks say it's poverty. Why, if we could just get everybody a acre and a 40 and a mule, why, everybody would be all right. And the only thing is people are not satisfied with a mule and an acre of land. Like, uh, like the king, uh, they, they want what they've got and want what you've got. You see, man is a sinner. He has a sin problem. The problem in your heart and in my heart is a principle. You call it what you want to, but the Bible calls it sin. Now, people try to deny that. Israel did. If you turn to the book of Malachi, would you do that, please? Keep your place in Isaiah. Go to the last book in the Old Testament. And let's watch how this works. In Malachi, and if you look at Malachi chapter 1 and verse 7, Malachi 1, 7, he says, You offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and you say, Wherein have we polluted thee? Again, in that you say, The table of the Lord is contemptible. In Malachi chapter 2 and verse 17, he says, You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, Wherein have we wearied thee? When you say, Everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them. Or, Where is the God of judgment? In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 7, Even from the days of your father you are gone away from mine ordinances, and have not kept them. Return unto me and I will return unto you. And you saith, Wherein shall I return, or shall we return? In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? The answer is in tithes and offerings. Now what's the point? The point is this. These people were operating under the principle of pretending to not be aware of their corruption. Someone has said the book of Malachi deals with unconscious corruption. Did you notice the word wherein kept coming up? God made the accusation. They said, wherein have we done this? God said, you've robbed me. They said, how? Uh, God said, uh, uh, you've reproached me. They said, how? Now, they're not asking for advice so they can change their ways. They're raising a question to excuse their behavior. And they said, how have we done this? They were justifying themselves. And so it's not uncommon when we... When God tries to point out our sin, you know what we do? We make excuses and say, why? What do you mean? What are you talking about? Why? That's not so. Everybody does that. And so God says, now let's reason together just a minute. You deny sin, let's talk about it. In this chapter, it is evident. If you notice in chapter 1 of the book of Isaiah, look down at what it says in verse 4. In verse 4, ah, sinful nation, a people laden with with iniquity, a seed of evildoers. First of all, these people were sinful. They were laden with iniquity. They were loaden, loaded down like a mule under its burden, like a person perhaps in, in, in India or in other parts of the world where you see these people loaded down. I was in Korea and visited Korea a few times, and I saw people carrying burdens big as that piano, and they were stooped over. I saw not long ago, saw a picture of a man carrying a V8 engine, motor, automobile motor, on, the ba on his back. Can you believe that? And the old man was stooped over. And those people had spent their life carrying those burdens. And as a result of carrying those burdens, their, their bodies were bent and, and they had aged and, and uh, they couldn't stand up straight. God said concerning his people Israel, a people laden with sin. That's why men can't hold their head up high. That's why men can't look God in the face. Is because they are burdened and loaded down with sin. And sin, ladies and gentlemen, will break you and destroy you. You don't need to deny the existence of sin. You need to come to God and reason that He is right what He says about sin. That's what you need to do. That's where you get started on it. In Isaiah chapter 4, He said, A sinful nation. Notice again, if you will, in this text, they had forsaken God. Can you imagine a man forsaking God? They forsook him. They turned their back upon him. Notice again, they are called seeds of evildoers. Their fathers were evildoers. They are evildoers. And if you and I don't change our ways, our children will be evildoers. We produce after our kind. And so, in this text, in verse 4, 
They are called laden with iniquity, seeds of evildoers, children that are corruptors, not adults that are corruptors. I watched on television the other day that there's a school in the area. You know, they're concerned about fourth graders organizing gangs already. Fourth graders. The principal said this is definitely a gang. They have a slogan. They have a leader. And they're organized. You know how they get initiated? They go around on the parking lot and they have to slug a smaller kid. That's the initiation program. Children. Children who are corruptors, starting out at an early age. Why, we would think of children as being pure and innocent, but our children are not pure, nor are they innocent. And the reason of that is the fact of sin. You notice again, in this text, it says they had forsaken the Lord and gone backward. Wouldn't you think that man would progress? Wouldn't you think that morally we would be doing better? I mean, we can put a man on the moon, but we can't find one man that can keep the Ten Commandments. We got a problem. <laughs> we can put a man on the moon, we can't stop using drugs. We can put a man on the moon, we can't get over alcohol. We can split the atom, but we can't keep our families together. Isn't there something wrong? And you see, we have substituted moral responsibility for communication and technology. And we look at a VCR, or we look at these uh, satellites circling our globe, or we look at men walking in space, and we say, we've come a long way. Who are you trying to kid? You haven't come a long way, you're going backward. You see, you're looking at the wrong thing. Just because there's a piece of junk floating in outer space doesn't mean you've come anywhere. But you see, we deceive ourselves, and we think communication and technology is progress. How are you doing in your life? You got it together? Or is there a principle there that tears your life apart and you don't know how to deal with it? I haven't found one person yet that could keep the Ten Commandments. I said to a fellow one time, what do you think you have to do to get to heaven? He said, keep the commandments. I said, name them. He couldn't. I said, you're in big trouble. You believe you have to keep the commandments and you can't even name them. You obviously are not going to heaven. I said, let me help you out. Thou shalt love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Do you do that? Well, I try. I said, I didn't ask you if you tried. I said, do you do it? Well, he said, no, Reverend, nobody does. I says, zap, one against you. I said, let me give you another one. Have you ever put anything between you and God? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Well, he, he said, everybody does. I said, we're not talking about everybody. We're talking about you. Well, he said, of course I have. Zap, two. We went down through those commandments, and did you know, he said, well, Reverend, I never killed anybody. I said, you know, if you were in school and you had ten questions and you missed nine, I think you'd flunk. He said, I think you're right. I haven't kept them. I said, no, my friend, and neither has anybody else. You see? You know why? Because you're a sinner. I know that's not flattering, but it's the truth. And by the way, I'm a sinner, and they are sinners, and we are sinners. And God says, let's just get together now, and let's just get rid of the rubbish, and let's get rid of all the vernacular, and let's just get down to where the rubber hits the road, and let's reason together about this issue. Is sin real, or is it not real? Let's reason about it. It is real. It is not ignorance. It's not environment. It's not education. It's not materialism. It is a principle that's in your bosom, and you were born with it, and you will die with it. And you can't get rid of it by getting baptized, or being confirmed, or keeping the commandments, or joining a church. You cannot get rid of it unless the God of heaven washes it away. You can't get rid of it. Laden with sin. Let's, let's reason together, he says. Notice again down in verse... Um, uh, 21 of this same chapter. Notice how he describes what happened to his people. He said, Hath not Israel or Jerusalem become a harlot? Isn't that something? Here is a people of God to the nation of Israel, Jerusalem, the city of peace. You know what he calls it? A harlot. A harlot. As a matter of fact, he calls them Sodom and Gomorrah in the same chapter. This is the fact of sin. Sin will take your purity and make a prostitute out of you. 
I don't mean you have to walk the streets and sell yourselves, but I'm talking about the middle, the average middle class system, a uh, uh, citizen, is selling themselves to the world and to the devil when they ought to be giving themselves to God. That's what harlotry is. It's having another husband other than God. That's adultery. That's the sin of adultery. Being yoked to or tangled with this world rather than being joined to the God of heaven. Jerusalem has become a harlot, joined to her idols. You understand the terminology. Not only that, their silver had been turned to dross. Silver speaks of redemption. Gold speaks of deity. Their testimony, their redemption had been polluted and it was full of dross. It was not acceptable. They couldn't, couldn't influence anybody with it. You lay out real silver coins, you can influence somebody. You lay out dross and you influence nobody. And their lives had so deteriorated that they had no influence among their own people or the heathen around them. And then their wine had been mingled with water. Wine is connected with joy in the Bible. And their joy had been diluted and polluted, and they'd lost it all. And by the way, you know why you've lost your joy? Because of sin. That's it. When you've lost your joy, there's probably sin living somewhere in your heart. And that's exactly what had happened to this nation. They had conceived sin. And sin, when it is conceived, brings forth death. Brings forth death to happiness. Brings forth death to joy. Sin brings forth death to relations. Sin ultimately brings forth physical death. And sin unrepented of brings forth eternal death. So God says, come on, let's reason about it. Let's reason about it. What's your problem? You know, <clears throat> are you going to claim that you have always been all that you could have been and should have been? You know, there's nobody in, in, in this room in their right mind that would ever stand up and say, I have always at all times been all that I should have been. Why not? Why not? Don't you think it's right to be all that you should be? Hmm? Then why didn't you? As a matter of fact, I know what is right but I don't always find the will to do what is right. Because when I see what is right, I find another law in my members warring against what is right. And that law, that principle that is in your heart is called the law of sin and death, and it works. And we say, you know, we look at these, the news and we see these men who molest these little children. And we say, those guys are crazy. They're not crazy. Oh, I agree that sometimes a fellow's, you know, may be retarded and do that, but the majority of them are not. The majority of them are just average citizen, respectable like you. You know what the problem is? It is a sinful, depraved heart. It is a principle. And by the grace of God, you'd be right there yourself. Keep playing with sin, keep watching pornography, keep reading dirty books, and you'll be there. Because it deteriorates you. Sin takes you down. And it is a principle that is in your heart, and if fanned, there is no limit to what you would do. There's no limit. No limit. And when you look at people that do things that appall you, you just remember, they didn't start out that way. But they had a principle in their bosom, a principle of sin, a law. And when that law is allowed to have free reign, you are headed for total destruction. God says, let's reason about it. Is it reasonable? Do you think that people who live in sin make the best citizens? Would you want them playing with your children next door? Well, let's reason about it then. Not only that, he said, let's reason about the effects of sin in verse 7. 
I'm sorry, not only in verse 7, but in verse 3. Let's look at verse 3. He says, The ox knoweth his owner, the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. You know, I, raised, I was raised on a farm as a boy, and I remember, as sure as I'm standing here, every night the cattle would start coming home. Every night. Almost you could set your clock by them. Those cows would be out over the hills there in northern Arkansas in the Ozarks, down along White River and uh, Piney Creek, and uh, they would be out in the woods grazing, you know, and laying down and chewing the cud and, and producing contented, uh, cow, you know, milk from contented cows. Uh, but uh, you know what would happen about uh, 4 or 5 o'clock? You'd hear them, Marr! Pretty good, huh? Aren't you glad you came to get that lesson? We'll be singing old MacDonald here in a minute. But listen to me. You could hear those cows uh, bawling. You could hear the cowbells ringing. And you could hear those cows running and jumping and playing as they're heading back for the barn. You know why? Because they knew in that barn is where they found their food. Can you imagine a cow being smarter than a man? You see, our problem is we are so bloated with pride that we're obnoxious. There is nothing worse than a fool and he doesn't know it. I mean, anybody can be a fool, but if you knew it, it would help you. But being a fool and not knowing it is totally obnoxious. And God says, my people have sinned, and the effect of that sin has destroyed their ability to reason that they don't even have enough sense to come in out of the rain. And by the way, it is going to rain, and then Peter tells me it's going to rain fire and brimstone. Do you have enough sense to come in out of it? Huh? <laughs> uh, is McDonald's cow smarter than you? Why, he said in verse 2, verse 3, the ox knows his owner. Do you know your owner? I know mine. I met him 35 years ago. I wasn't looking for him. He was looking for me. He'd been looking for me for a long time. As a matter of fact, I can almost remember when he started looking for me. I was just about five years old in a little one-room schoolhouse in Boswell, Arkansas, and an evangelist was there. I don't remember anything he said, but I remember we all stood at the invitation. And as he began to give the invitation, something began to happen in my heart, and I cried. And I got a hold of my aunt, my Aunt Laura, and I said something to her. I don't remember what I said. And she said to me, she says, I think God is speaking to you. But that's all that was ever said. I think my Heavenly Father was calling my name and looking for me, and as a five-year-old boy, I could have been saved. But I wasn't. Then I remember a few years later, I was sitting in my grandpa's house reading my Bible, reading his Bible. I had an interest in it. I was trying to read it. And I'll never forget what my Uncle Roy said to my grandpa. He says, you make sure you tell that boy right. I remember that. Those two, those two events I remember. Those are my religious experiences. Until as a 17-year-old boy, I was sitting in the back row of the First Baptist Church in Wenatchee, Washington. And God found me and saved me. And for 35 years, I've known my owner and my master. I know where my barn is, and I know who feeds me, and I know who takes care of me. You see, I know that now, but I didn't know it for 17 years. I didn't know it. Israel doesn't know it. That's what it says. Israel doesn't know me. Do you know him? I didn't ask you if you believed in there's, there's a God. I said, do you know him? Is he your owner, really? Is he your master? Is that where you go to get fed? Israel doesn't come now, let us reason together. Look at the effects of sin. It destroys our reasoning ability. Not only that, <clears throat> you'll notice what God, uh, not only that, they lacked, they, they, they lacked uh, intelligence as to who God was. The effects of sin, verse 7, your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence. I sat in a home yesterday, a 19-year-old boy, who had made lots of money, who's been in and out of jail, said to me, he said, man, Pastor Blue, I sure have been stupid. I said, yeah, you have. 
This boy made several thousands of dollars, bought a brand new truck, lost it every bit, lost his truck, lost all of his money, lost it all. He said, I'm going to do better. I said, I hope you do. But you know that what sin will do, it'll take your dignity. Then it'll take your family. Then it'll take your health. Then it takes your job. And then it takes your life. That's the way it goes. That's the effect of sin. If sin isn't checked, it's going to be the end of you. It's going to be the end of you. You have to check it. You've got to take care of it. It's a principle, like a disease. And you have to come to the great physician and let him do something about it. The cities were in chaos. Possessions were lost. And sin had robbed them like it did the prodigal son. Thirdly, sin is not only a fact. He says, let's reason about the effect. But he said, sin is also an affront to God. If you'll notice uh, that in verse 2, the Lord says, Hear, O heaven, and give earth, give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Do you know that a child who rebels against his parents is an affront to those parents? The word affront means insult. God says, My people are an insult to me. I have nourished them. I have brought them up. Let me tell you something. I fed my kids and worked and fed those kids for 18 to 20 years. Bought every meal for them. Bought every stitch of clothes for them. Paid their house rent every morning. Bought the bed they slept in. Gave them their first cars paid their education from the first grade through the twelfth grade, every one of them, five of them. I paid that. For those kids to turn around and dishonor their father is not only a front, it's an insult. It is an insult to what I have tried to do for them. You understand that? Now, sin is an affront to God. God says, let's reason about it. I have nourished you, the nation of Israel. I have nourished you. I have fed you. And then he says in verse 2, and they have rebelled against me. Why is it logical? Is it logical for you to bite the hand that feeds you? I told, uh, told Shane Lundquist the other day, I said, son, <laughs> we were talking when he was living in the other place, and he didn't run away from home. He was doing what he, you know, what he wanted to, and there's no problem. But we were talking about it. He said, I think I'm going to go home. I said, I think you're smart. And he's back at home now, isn't he? And he's still, and he's smart. You know, he doesn't do anything, but he's smart. He's home, you see. And you know what I said? I said, hey, your mother will wash your clothes. Your dad will buy you food. You know, they'll pay your rent for a while. But you know what the smart thing is? If you can, is go back and get things right with your father. And get things right with your mother. They're not perfect. They are sinners, just like you. They made mistakes, like you will. But get it right. We all have sin principles. We all make mistakes. But we don't have to get bitter and destroy our lives and the lives of others because of that. Sin is an affront to God. Listen to me. Think this through. Do you know that if I believe that there is a God and then I knowingly sin, do you know what I'm saying to God? I don't care what you think. If I know there's a God, and I'm conscious of it, and I knowingly sin, it is an affront to God. Brother Jim's a police officer. It would be like his boy, him in uniform, in his police car, and his boy taking off down here to stop sign with his dad sitting here, with people standing around and his, and his boy running a stop line and speeding and spinning his turn. He'd be, it'd be an affront to his father. be an insult. You understand how that works? So... When we sin, if we know there's a God and we believe there's a God, our rebellion is an affront to God. It's an insult to Him. Why, it'd be an insult if your kids did that to you, wouldn't it, Dad? You'd take it as a personal insult. God says, okay, now let's reason about that. Let's reason about that. 
Last of all, in verse 18, he talks about the removal of sin. He said, let's reason about that. Martin Luther said, if you could have your sins removed by monkery, he said, I would have had my sins removed a long time ago. For he said, I was a devout Catholic priest. But the only way you can have your sins removed is to have God to remove them. Look at verse 18. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Scarlet dye was made from a particular worm. And by some kind of a process with this worm, they could make a red dye. And then that dye, of course, was used to alter the appearance of certain garments. And once those garments had been dyed, it was almost impossible to get that color out without destroying the garment. And the thing is, in our attempt many times to try to get sin out of our lives, we destroy ourselves. Fellow's got guilt, so what does he do? Gets drunk. Fellow's got anger, what does he do? He goes and does something foolish and destroys himself. Fellow wants to get right with God, what does he do? He tries to physically abuse his body to get rid of sin. It won't work. You see, the only way that dye could successfully be removed would be from someone from without to do some kind of a process on it to completely change it. And the only way that the principle of sin can be neutralized in our lives is for God himself to perform the new birth in our hearts and in our lives. It's the only way it can be done. Ben Mobeck said to me just the other day before he went up, you know what he said to me? Ben Mobeck said, my AA program was Jesus. All right, listen to me. Here's a guy that was 47 years old, visited this church one Sunday morning. I got through preaching. He walked the aisle, and he accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. Now, he just left Friday and went fishing. That's why he's not here. But, the commercial fisherman, but he told me, I don't remember being sober from the time I was a kid. He said, I would drink anything that had any alcohol, and if it didn't, I'd make it. And Brother Jack Foster, you grew up on the same island. You know Ben. And both, both of you, Bob, you too. I said, did you ever smoke? He said, only when I drink. And I drank all the time. He was so desperate for alcohol that he went to a, to a canning shop there on one of the islands off of Sandpoint with a shotgun and went in and held up the people there and stole cases of liquor. Desperate. I may have my story wrong, but this is the way I have it. His father and his brother drowned in a boating accident. Maybe alcohol was involved, I don't know. His brother just recently burned up in a trailer in Sandpoint, isn't that right? I met that brother, chronic alcoholic. Ben has a sister, chronic alcoholic. Ben was a chronic alcoholic. You know what the difference is? The only difference is one day the old boy walked the aisle, that Indian walked the aisle and accepted Jesus Christ. And you know what he said to me? And by the way, he's been here about seven years plus. You know what he said to me? I have never wanted another drop of liquor or another cigarette. Jesus is my AA program. That's what he told me just the other day. I am telling you that there is a God in heaven who has the power to forgive you for all of your sins and make you white in his sight and to give you the power to live right while you're here. Now, wouldn't you like to be clean? Do you like being dirty? You don't like that. Nobody does. You don't like it. It destroys your self-image. It makes you not feel good about yourself. You, nobody likes to be dirty. That's why people are full of bitterness and anger and hatred is because they're dirty. You get clean and you love people and you feel good. You know when I got saved, I didn't know one verse in the Bible. I went forward, a man took a Bible and showed me how to, sa uh, to be saved. On the way out of that church, I felt like I was walking about that high off of the sidewalk, and I said to my girlfriend, who's here this morning, 
I said to her, I feel like a great burden has been lifted off of my shoulders. Didn't we just read earlier, ah, oh, sinful nation laden with sin? I was 17 years old and starting to carry that burden and didn't know what it was. I was already pack a day, 17, starting to drink that stuff, dragging the name of the beautiful Savior through the dirt, which I'm ashamed. I was laden with sin. I didn't know it. And that day I got saved. I'm telling you, it was like a burden rolled off of my back. I went down the hill and went into the sepulcher, and I saw it no more. Come now. Listen. Come now, saith the Lord. Let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, nothing can get them out. They shall be like wool. Though they be red as crimson, I'll make them as white as snow. You know what? When you get saved, your sins are all forgiven, all past, all present, and all future. And God says, I remember them no more. Isn't that wonderful? Why, would you think a man was in his right mind to turn that down? Come now, he says. Let us reason together. Sin is a fact. It's a fact in your life. Sin has an effect. How you doing? Sin is an affront to God. But sin's removal is a miracle that God can work like he did old Ben. Brother Jack Foster, sitting here this morning, dignified man, owned the tavern in Sandpoint, Alaska. I don't know much about his life, but I know something about it now. One day I went into their home with their niece, and as we walked down toward that beautiful little home, Sharon Hackless said to me, this is my aunt, I love them so much, and she says, I'm so afraid that they'll reject us. We went in, sat down, opened the Bible with them. How long ago has that been, Brother Jack? 14 years ago.